In the liturgical debates that are gripping the church of the Roman Rite, we often hear a comparison or a justification for liturgical reforms owing to the Eastern customs. But today on the with One Peter Five podcast, we will talk with Dr. Peter Kwasniewski about the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is that there are two brothers and a stranger. The two brothers are the Greek rite, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, as, long as, as well as the other Eastern rites, and the Latin rite, the Roman rite, and the stranger is the Novus Ordo. Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy S. Flanders, editor in chief of One Peter Five, and we're here with our contributing editor and weekly columnist, Dr. Kwasniewski. Always a pleasure and an honor, Doctor. Glad to have you on once again. Thank you, Timothy. Likewise. Excellent. So uh, before we continue, as always, we rely on your donations to continue One Peter Five. Keep it going. We have bills to pay, so we appreciate your donations. It's going to, getting to be the Christmas season very soon. Advent starting just this Sunday, which is crazy. But um, we do ask for your donations. Uh, we're going to start our our um, a second yearly fundraiser starting next week. Uh, so we, we're still in need of rebuilding our donor base. So please consider donating at the end of the year, becoming a monthly monthly donor that really helps us pay our bills. So today on the podcast, we're talking with Dr. Kwasniewski with this this phrase that you, I think and you invented this phrase, two brothers and a stranger, am I right? This yes. was the way that you described it. And this is all based on Kwasniewski's latest text published by Tan Books, The Once and Future Roman Rite. You can buy that below at the link at tanbooks.com. And before we get further into the actual topic, um, Dr. K, can you kind of give us a little curated look at where this book fits into your other works you have other works that are on this same topic, and then you have also other works on, on larger topics as well. Uh, but where does this book fit into your books on the liturgy? Yes. Well, basically, um, I guess I would say this is the book that I am um, that, that I consider my most important work to date. Um, it's the fruit of all of my thinking on liturgical subjects. Not that the earlier books are sketches or um, are tentative, but uh, I, there are things that have grown with me over time that I've seen further into, I think. Uh, and this book, I think, represents kind of the fruition of all of my work on the Roman liturgy. Um, in particular, the, the focus of this book is a sort of knockdown, you know, no holds barred demonstration that the Novus Ordo is not the Roman rite, is not part of the family of the Roman rite, uh, it bears at best some generic uh, resemblances to it. It's a kind of um, uh, uh, de deconstructed extrapolation from the Roman tradition. And that, in fact, the Roman rite has a very strong, definite, concrete uh, essence and identity and physiognomy to it that we can, that we can uh, uh, articulate by looking at all of the different aspects of its history and of its performance. Um, and so really... The book is called The Once and Future Roman Rite, as if to say, we are talking about the traditional Latin Roman Rite. That's what we're talking about when we say the Roman Rite. Um, and so part of this book, part of part of the argument contained in here is also then bringing in the Eastern tradition to say, look, all traditional liturgies behave and, and look certain ways. Um, and the Novus Ordo doesn't behave that way, and it doesn't look that way. Um, and there's a reason for that. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by chance. It wasn't just an abuse. Um, and, and this is a, a, a deep problem that we have to address. So that's that's kind of how it fits into the work. Into the well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Kwasniewski's Manifesto, your your finest work, uh, and uh, that really says it all. It's, it's a very large work, very deep pondering over years and years and years, Dr. Kwasniewski. As as many should know, um, you started your journey. You had you had a liturgical journey through this whole morass of this whole crisis, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, just really quickly, just want to mention uh, the article that's on the website right now is very apropos. Church Life Journal insults Eastern liturgies with amateur scholarship. 
And this is what we're going to be talking about is this whole problem. Uh, and it's actually occasioned by the feast day today, which is very funny. Let me see. Oh, okay. Here it is. So liturgythehome.com, we always promote this, this liturgical calendar, but this will show us uh, an important feast day and uh, actually this week. So today is the feast day of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, which is going to show what we're talking about. Because for one thing, this is a historical event that occurred in Our Lady's life when she was presented to the temple as a girl, as Michaela Har Harrison has has so beautifully depicted here. We have St. Anne and Joachim presenting Our Lady in the temple. And this is this is a tradition. This is something that's not contained in the Holy Scripture, but it is, it is part of a, an oral tradition that was written down later, which was accepted by the church, East and West. This is one of the 12 great Byzantine feasts of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's lesser known in the West. It's just sort of lesser appreciated in the West. So it's a third class feast. But the old Collect in the Roman Rite mentioned the historicity of this event. And it has a beautiful Collect, which, which petitions our mighty God to present us just as Our Lady was presented in the temple, to present us also in the glory of the Father. But in the Novus Ordo, because of different operating principles, which we'll discuss, that Collect was gutted, which cast doubt on whether or not this event actually happened, even though the church East and West has accepted this as a historical event in the tradition of the church. Now, likewise, we have the exact same thing really happening over here with this feast day of St. Catherine of Alexandria, which is happening on this Friday. This is a, a martyr, a philosopher, a female philosopher, martyr, very unique saint uh, in the early church, which who and who uh, enjoyed widespread veneration East and West. Um, the tradition says that the angels actually took her relics to Mount Sinai, which is where they are today. I've actually been to the monastery, the monastery of St. Catherine of Siena or Sir Catherine of uh, Alexandria in Sinai, where they have her relics. And uh, this was one of the saints that appeared to St. Joan of Arc and spoke to her. And the Novus Ordo just completely removed this feast. It was just removed entirely, uh, apparently for these historicity reasons because there was doubts as to various details of her life. Now, thankfully, to his credit, John Paul II actually reinserted the feast into the Novus Ordo. So it's still, so it's now on the Novus Ordo calendar once again. But once again, the collect was gutted. So the collect no longer, no longer speaks of this uh, traditional event of translating the relics. It, uh, it, I mean, there's nothing erroneous per se about it, but it once again applies this historicism against tradition. So any comments on, on the occasions of our feast days here, Dr. Um, I mean, the only comment I would make is, uh, in addition to what you've said, um, you know, about the loss of, 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 of uh, so-called legendary content, which has always been believed by Christians, the loss of dogmatic density, the loss of, of uh, poetry. I mean, the, the, the poetry of these old prayers is, is notable and the new ones are just made out of you know, plastic by comparison. Um, but, but also just the fact that I've seen again and again and again, how often devotion in the East and West parallel one another. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, feasts that were very prominent in the East over the centuries entered into the Western calendar. And sometimes it even went in the other direction as when we influenced the Eastern uh, 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 observance of Christmas, uh, where, whereas they had put all their emphasis on epiphany. So we have this kind of mutual enrichment going on between East and West. And often the saints who were removed or demoted from the Novus Ordo calendar are ones that you find on the Eastern calendar. So, I mean, it's, this is anticipating a little bit one of our themes, but the ecumenism that drove the liturgical reform was not East-West ecumenism. It was Protestant ecumenism. That's what, in other words, the changes to the Roman Catholic liturgy were made with an eye to the Protestants and not even the high church Protestants, but the low church Protestants uh, or the evangelical Protestants. Whereas what we had in common with the East is what was marginalized uh, in many cases, as we'll get to. Yeah, that's a great point, because the, the only thing that the Novus Ordo actually does reflect and imitate is Protestant liturgies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, when we compare the Novus Ordo to East and West, various Eastern liturgies, not the, not just the divine liturgy, but other Eastern liturgies. As a, in that article, we had the Coptic liturgy, all these different e traditional apostolic liturgies 
contrasts sharply with the Novus Ordo, and the Novus Ordo alone imitates the Protestant low church liturgies. It's very important. Right, and as, as Bishop Schneider rightly points out, uh, with regard to something like the manner of receiving Holy Communion, uh, what has developed as normative practice in the Novus Ordo, and even practice that is uh, imposed by bishops' conferences, is based on Calvinist practice, not even Lutheran practice. Uh, there, there are Lutherans who receive communion kneeling in a more devout manner than most Catholics do in the Novus Ordo world. So, um, we, I mean, it's it's very. This is this get when you start to get into these things. Um, then you realize, as one of the chapters in my book goes into, although I don't think we're going to talk about it much today, um, one of my chapters, I talk about how the Protestant critique of Catholic liturgy ended up being embraced by the liturgical reformers themselves. That is, the Protestants rejected medieval liturgy as superstitious and as um, you know excessively focused on the miraculous and on the legendary um, and, and too ascetical. Uh, and you know, uh, and too you know, too caught up with the veneration of the body and blood of Christ, and this is what the Protestant reformers were saying. And then in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, you see the Roman Catholic liturgical reformers saying the same things about the Tridentine rite. Um, so these and these, of course, these themes, you know, you see this in Michael Davies where he talks about Cranmer's godly order, the incredibly detailed parallels between what Thomas Cranmer did to dismantle the Catholic liturgy in England and essentially to rip the Catholic faith out of the hearts of the people and what the liturgical reformers after Vatican II did. I mean, when, when you see these things, you can't unsee them, right? And you have to ask, why are these why are these parallels there, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, the uh, po Pope Francis is concerned that the trads are weaponizing the Latin mass to reject Vatican II, but the reality, which is even a far bigger problem than even that apparent problem, is that, as you said, these reformers, these Catholic reformers, are weaponizing the Novus Ordo to reject Trent. Yes. That's what, And this is what Joseph Ratzinger himself said this very thing. He said the reason they hate the Latin mass is because they hate Trent. Yes. And they're a, you know, yeah. they're, they want to be Lutheran. Right. And that, that's a serious problem. That's even far more fundamental than a contentious council that happened 60 years ago. Yeah. Far more fundamental. It's undermining these basic dogmas. So let, let me get into um, more <laughs> into this. There's so many things to say. We're, I mean, this podcast is just going to scratch the surface of this text. So, uh, again, you need to go buy this, everyone, to, to get deeper into this, this important manifesto. But I, I was thinking about before we got on the air, I was thinking about what is the, the most fundamental thing which makes the two brothers brothers and the stranger a stranger. And uh, many people talk about very superficial similarities mm -hmm. between, because sometimes they're, they're, they're saying, oh, the Novus Ordo <laughs> is actually restoring active participation and, and things like, or they, you know, reading and whatnot, reading the vernacular, uh, things that are happening in the Byzantine liturgy. But these are all very superficial things as you show. And I wanted to actually read from chapter one. You have a whole chapter with the two brothers and strangers that you, you titled that. But chapter one, I think, cuts to the core of this. What is this essential similarity? So I'm going to quote I want to quote from pa uh, page 28. And uh, this, I think, gets at the essential. The essential brothers are the principal tradition, but also the principle of ex the experience of the almighty God by means of that tr liturgical tradition. It's just, it's not, it's not just this museum piece as, as the, as the critics say, this is an, this is a, a experience of God. And this is what you write on page 28. You quote various people who have experienced the Latin mass. You say the lady who wrote this, I was so overcome by the solemnity and beauty of the mass that I was reduced to tears. The family man who confessed, I am finding that the TLM holds a beauty and truth that are simply missing elsewhere. Uh, the Franciscan alumnus who sighed, I feel like I finally come home. The husband and wife who were astounded at how the ancient mass elicited their prayer. The scholar who noted its demands bring forth a response in us. And here's, I think, the money quote that you have in, you, in your text here. You say, please note that such reactions are not in response to the real presence of Christ, which is there in any form of mass. Because this is what people often say. Well, it's just Jesus is in the mass. It's got the real presence. The Novus Ordo is valid. Why are you complaining? You say they are reactions to a concentrated constellation of ecclesiastical traditions that was handed down for centuries and indecorously scrapped in the post-conciliar reinvention of our corporate self-image. 
Traditional liturgy has the power to induce in us appropriate attitudes when we are assisting at the holy sacrifice, privileged to be in the flesh and blood presence of our Lord, humility, reverential fear, devotion, contrition, self-abandonment, tranquil joy, end quote. I think in particular, the famous story of the conversion of St. Vladimir, when he was he, he sent envoys to these different liturgies and he experienced God at the divine liturgy in, in Constantinople. He said, we couldn't, the envoys couldn't, we couldn't tell if we were in heaven and on earth. And, yeah. and that was the experience of God, which comes by means of tradition. And it's, it, but it's not just that it's passed down. It's that what is passed down is what is most conducive, most fitting for mm -hmm. the experience of God. So Dr. Kwasniewski, if you can comment on that, and also why is the Novus Ordo lacking all those things? Yeah. So basically, I mean, this gets into the whole question of organic development, uh, which I go into a lot in the book. Um, you know, what is organic development? What is this concept? Well, it doesn't mean it's a metaphor. It doesn't mean that the liturgy is literally a plant that grows automatically, you know, the way that, that a plant grows with no human intervention. No, I mean, of course, the whole history of the liturgy is, is um, you know, different holy men and women uh, writing hymns that are then incorporated into the liturgy or some particular pope introduces a certain prayer. So there's definitely human agency. There's volun voluntary, uh, um, uh, it's the, the liturgy could be described as a corporate work of art to which thousands of individuals have contributed. Think about all the anonymous composers of Gregorian chant over many centuries, each one adding a little piece to this great cathedral. I mean, it's more like a medieval cathedral, like a Gothic cathedral that took 200 years to build. You know, some of some of them did, right? And you started with one team of architects and builders and you ended up with a totally different team of architects and builders. But the, the, the end result is something glorious and magnificent. And it has a unity, though it also has a lot of diversity and sometimes even chronological diversity. Like part of the cathedral is in one Gothic style and another part is in a different Gothic style. And then even later on, the pipe organ that was put in is in a Baroque style, you know, and so you've got, you've got this, this kind of common work of art on which many generations have worked to which they've contributed. Um, but they all were animated by a certain common idea, set of ideas, right? Um, they all understand uh, what this is for, what this work of art is for. Um, and, and they're trying to glorify God and elevate the minds and hearts of the faithful by doing it. So I guess when, when it comes to the liturgy um, as, a, as an age old collective work of art, if you can put it that way, what we have to understand is that the traditional attitude or mentality of all Christians is that the church is not just inventing liturgy on its own by a process of trial and error and experimentation and just sort of random decisions made by committees or something. No, it's a process guided by the Holy Spirit himself who will lead us into the fullness of truth, as Christ says. And so the general view that we get in church history is the, the development of the liturgy. It, yes, individuals are contributing to it, most of them anonymous, but what is accepted and, uh, and, and what dominates and what is passed down is generally under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so we can say, indeed, as many authors, I quote many, many authors saying that the liturgy is the work of the Holy Spirit, and we certainly must accept that. Um, and so what I've, what I've tried to illustrate in this diagram, you brought up a diagram from the book, is that at the beginning of the history of the church, when Christian liturgy is first being formed out of Jewish and Roman and Greek ingredients, uh, just to put it in shorthand, um, you know, the Holy Spirit is maximally active as inspiring new rites and prayers, right? There has to be a first Eucharistic prayer ever. There has to be a first set of proper antiphons. You know, there are the first Gregorian chants. There's a lot of newness at the beginning, um, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring those things. That's what the letter A indicates, the maximum inspiration of new rites and prayers. But as time goes on, and there, there are rites and prayers already in existence, the work of the Holy Spirit, you might say, shifts to preserving those traditional rites and prayers so, and, and inspiring the church to, to retain them and to hand them down as something now, as a treasured possession, right? And that's what letter B indicates, a sort of increase in 
this role of the Holy Spirit as preserving rites and prayers. Do you see how this works? As, as the need for new rites and prayers decreases, the need to preserve them and hand them on increases, right? Um, and so, you know, you see this, this chart is about the, uh, the Roman rite. Um, maximum pluralism, variability, and plasticity in the apostolic age, right? There are certainly, you know, the Roman canon, uh, I mean, contrary to what some authors say, was not likely to be on the lips of St. Peter in the form in which we find it in, you know, the 1962 Missal. That's not the point. The point is that it developed slowly, and by the time you get to St. Gregory the Great, the Roman canon was already seen as a classic anaphora, the way that the Roman church consecrates the Eucharist is with the Roman canon. It's already traditional by the time St. Gregory the Great uh, makes the final edits or redactions to it. And from the time of Gregory the Great to the present, the Roman canon has seen almost no change, right? Why is that the case? Is that because everybody just suddenly lost their creativity or had no more new ideas? No, it's because they saw that this is a rich, adequate, beautiful uh, and, and traditional way of praying, right? And we love that. We love that as Catholics. The Holy Spirit gives us the love of tradition. That's not, it's such a bizarre thing in the church that, that the love of tradition now is something you have to defend. That's, if you rate every father of the church, every doctor of the church yes. takes it for granted that tradition is simply something you love. You love what's handed down. From, from your forefathers and how they worshiped, how they prayed, what they believed. Dogma and discipline and liturgy, all these things were alike. Things that you received en masse, right, as a block, right? And you didn't ask yourself, like some kind of rabbinical scholar, you know, oh, well, what's de fide and what's merely disciplinary? And, and oh, well, liturgical things, they can change, but dogma can't change. And so I guess we receive dogma from tradition, but we don't receive liturgy. From... No, that's absurd. That's a completely schizophrenic mentality. I mean, precisely because of lex orandi, lex credendi, right? We receive the tradition as liturgical worship and as dogma, all as one big, huge um, content, right? Uh, and so that's what I'm showing with this, this, the gradually progressing and developing liturgy um, is our inheritance, right? And I, I know I'm going on here, but let me just mention one thing that I say in the book, and this is so important, right? People sometimes say, well, look, if the, if the history of, of the liturgy shows additions being made over time, um, then can't we just, you know, then then what's wrong? I mean, it, doesn't that mean that it's just a human uh, product and that we can reconfigure it as we want at any later moment? And what I'm saying is that's never been the attitude or the practice of anybody in the history of the church. They 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 add, they augment, they they decorate, they ornament the liturgical tradition, but they don't throw out what's already been formed and what's already been developed. So here's what I say on page 287. We are well aware that these prayers, the prayers of the liturgy, were built up over time. And that, for example, the last gospel was a relatively late addition, the last gospel, the prologue of St. John at the end of the Trinity Mass. But the additions happened for good reason. They happened under the gentle influence of the Holy Spirit. It is one thing not to have known them in an earlier century. It is quite another to remove them after they had been appropriately and harmoniously added and had become a fixed part of the rite for centuries, right? So it's one thing to say, okay, we're in the 10th century. Nobody's reading the last gospel at the end of the mass. That's not wrong. It just wasn't there yet. But later on, when people started reading it all over Europe, and then it became codified as part of the Trinity Missal, or actually even earlier than that, and then it was read at the end of every single mass for 500 years or more, then to get rid of it is a statement. And that's saying something, right? That's saying something bad, which is that, oh, this is a this is a superfluous piece of fluff. We don't need it here. Maybe it's even harmful here. It makes mass too long. People are in a hurry. They need to get to soccer or whatever. You know, what whatever your silly reasons are, that is an anti-traditional mentality in a way that wasn't true in the 10th century when they didn't have it, right? Yeah, it, this is this is ultimately a heretical view of history. It's a heretical view of the Holy Spirit's working in history because every heretic that arises over 2,000 years, they say, one, uh, there's been a corruption. We, we've we've gone we've gone off course, and I'm the founder who's going to bring us back on course. Follow me, 
And yes. that's what every single heretic says. Now, this is contrast sharply with the way that the church actually reforms, which is a return to form. It's St. Teresa of Avila saying to the Carmelites, you've become lax. Let's go back to the original founding of the Carmelites and let's get more rigorous. And that's that's the way that the church actually, because there is, there is a corruption that happens here and there, but it's not in terms of this overarching claim about the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, the 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 corrupt the corruptions that someone like Pius V in the 16th century wanted to address were not wholesale corruptions of entire portions of the liturgy, but but something like typographical errors, errors of copyists that entered into manuscripts that were being either written by hand or printed by early printing presses. And they wanted to ensure that the Roman rite was transmitted in the most pristine manner possible. But what that meant was the Roman rite as organically developed through the Middle Ages, through the Carolingian period, with the Gallican enhancements, the whole the whole kit and caboodle is what Pius V wanted to preserve, right? Um, Whereas you have, I mean, Garanger actually has this incredible passage. I quote this on page 211. Listen to this. He says, and this is exactly your point. He says, all sectarians without exception begin by claiming the rights of antiquity, right? There's the antiquarianism. We can talk about that. They wish to free Christianity of all that has sunk into falsehood and has become unworthy of God because of man's error and passions. They only wish they say, for the primordial, and they assert the claim that they are returning back to the cradle of Christian institutions. To this end, they shorten, obliterate, and cut away. Everything falls under their blows. Whoever expectantly wishes to see before his eyes divine worship in its original purity finds himself instead besieged with new formulas which are but a day old and indisputably penned by men as their authors are still living. Right? So what Garanger is pointing out, the irony there, uh, if you if you take it now, you know, in, in reference to the Novus Ordo, that the, the Novus Ordo reformers who are saying, we're just restoring what was there in ancient times, right? Actually, in most cases, all that you get are just their products, the things that they wrote. They're kind of cut and paste with scissors and glue, you know, bits and pieces from old manuscripts, which they've edited for political correctness, right? No, you're not seeing authentic original liturgy. You're just seeing the work of the Concilium and its 1970s philosophy. That's what you're seeing. Yes. And, and this is, as you, I just want to emphasize again, what you just said, it, it's so strange when you look at the fathers and the classics and all the popes, it's strange that we have to defend ourselves as traditionalists. We have to defend yeah. that we're defending tradition. That This is well, the assumption of everybody. Exactly. And I think, I think the main reason, and I definitely don't want to digress about this because we have so much else to talk about, but I think the main reason for that, that cognitive dissonance is the hyperpapalism that we've talked about before. That is yes. the, the view that crept in that the Pope alone is worth more than all of tradition and that his word, his word vetoes the whole of tradition. If the Pope, I even talk about this in the book, a, a friend of mine who said, obviously I disagree with him, but we're still friends. Uh, a friend of mine who said, if the Pope gutted the entire Roman liturgy of everything that's ever been there and rewrote it from scratch, and then put his papal stamp of approval on it, that would be the Roman rite. Okay, well, this is pure nominalism. I mean, this is, this. I don't even know what to call this. It's, it seems like insanity to me. That is, that the Pope alone, that the living Pope, whatever number Pope he is, let's say number 266, right, that this Pope alone by his absolute monarchical command can abolish and abrogate the entirety of Christian tradition of worship, the entire Lex Arandi, and simply redefine it. I mean, I think that's where you get to at the kind of extreme, uh, you know, with, with the hyper-papalists, if you push them on their own principles, the, you, they end up having to say something like that. Um, now, why is that wrong? I think it's wrong because of this point that the way the church worships for century after century after century is, is something that God wanted to be there. It, and if you end up saying, as the liturgical reformers did, that there were things erroneous or misleading or deficient about the way the church was worshiping, not just for a few years, but for centuries and millennia, right? I mean, then I think you're just calling into question the, the Catholicism as such. You're calling into question the Christian faith. And I think that you're that if you really believe that, you should be an atheist or a secularist or a nihilist. You shouldn't be a Catholic at that point. 
Yeah, I think that the uh, our critics place so much on the Pope that they don't realize that they're actually undermining two thousand years of history. Yes. You're you're not, you're undermining dozens of popes. You yeah. you think that we're undermining one pope, but you <laughs> by your you are actually undermining dozens of popes. And I want to just point out, I just linked this below. This is one of Kwasniewski's finest essays. That that because people m many of our critics don't understand. They they think that we're Eastern we're making Eastern Orthodox arguments or something like that or or that we're trying to you know undermine Vatican One that's not the case at all and this this essay makes the proper distinctions and helps to clarify you know because because we live in this this ultramontanist era this clericalist era we can't even talk this way without people misunderstanding and thinking that we're trying to make an Eastern Orthodox argument that's not the case at all yes. um, I, and yeah. I want to let me get I want to get back to your your um, ch chart number two here okay. But I just wanted to say, this is exactly the same way East and West, liturgically. And I think of um, particular cases where um, there has been some form of iconoclasm. So the, the most wide-reaching anathema against iconoclasts was at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which said, whoever <laughs> rejects an ecclesiastical tradition, written or unwritten, let him be anathema. Because the debate at that time was about sacred images. Yes. which is yes. a comparatively lower tradition in terms of its its authoritative weight, a comparatively lower to the liturgy itself, yes. to, the, to the actual rituals. So we're talking about something, we're talking about sacred art. You know, this yes. is, whoever does that, let it be anathema. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our, pardon me, Martin Mosebach has made the point, uh, and as you know, I'm very fond of him, I quote him a lot, um, that the liturgy is the greatest icon of all, right? In what sense? Well, an icon is an image of Christ. It is a vehicle through which we encounter Christ and through which he gives himself to us, right? Well, in, an icon of Christ, it, you know, painted on a, on a board, it does that in a very obvious manifest way. There is the image of Christ. We interact with him. He interacts with us. Um, but the liturgy is the, is the supreme and primordial icon. It's the icon of all icons. It's, it's the home of the icons in the, in the artistic sense, right? They, they, have, they wouldn't have any function were it not for the, the divine liturgy. Um, and so, I mean, that's what endows them with their iconicity, right? So when, when the Protestants were, the Protestant iconoclasts were attacking the Catholic statues and churches, and they were also burning missiles and tearing them up, right? They understood that this is all of a piece, all, all of a piece. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'm going to put this to, to conclude our tradition conversation, which really, this is, so this is one of your great charts from the book. <laughs> um, so compare, I'm just going to read this out really quickly, especially for the, the audio listeners. So the tradition, the two brothers and a stranger, we have the, the Greek rite, the tradition is origins lost in time, handed down from centuries, uh, which is the same in their own right. Whereas the Novus Ordo is constructed by a committee in the 1960s from reassembled bits of Western and Eastern traditions. Now, once again, the two brothers, Greek rite and Roman rite, both are attributed to great saints, but mostly anonymous in auth authorship. Whereas contrasted with this, the stranger, the Novus Ordo, the authors and compilers are known by name and most without reputations for sanctity, and none of its architects has a cause open for canonization. Archbishop Benigni was later exiled for his schemings. So we have machinations going on here, not, not saints driving this. And then uh, lastly, it has its authority from tradition, as we're saying, as well as papal legislation, whereas the modern Roman rite does not have its authority from tradition in and of itself, merely the ratification of the Roman pontiff. So that's the tradition. I wanted to just emphasize um, one thing before we get to our next chart, um, which because this gets into it a little bit more. And that, that's what the original the, the quote that I first read from your your um, uh, was your for your chapter one, which was so important, was the experience of God, because I think that many people who are commenting about this controversy have not heard mass and attempted to pray in these rites for a long period of time. You may have visited once, you may have seen a YouTube video, but if you are not praying in that ritual for a period of time, six months to a year, it is difficult for you to understand why are trads so up in arms about this situation? Yes. You know, pe people, people yeah. are saying, well, hey, it's just, it's the real presence, that's mm -hmm. all you need. But mm -hmm. if you haven't actually experienced it, it's very difficult for you to understand what you're talking about, yes. un unfortunately.
Yeah, no, I mean, look, there, this is what you say is true. Experience, so the reason why experience is so important when it comes to traditional liturgy, Eastern or Western, is that these traditions are very rich, very ancient, uh, very dense. Uh, they work at multiple levels uh, of, uh, of both in terms of how the liturgy is structured and executed and also different levels of the human person the conscious levels, the subconscious levels, emotions, imagination, memory, senses, intellect, you know, the heart ultimately. Um, and so we're, we're basically, we're entering into some kind of massive, mysterious, gigantic world that, and our eyes are not uh, accustomed to that. Our ears are not attuned to that yet. So we actually need to sort of, it's like when you go into a dark room, you need to let your eyes adjust to it. Or when you're trying to listen for something very faint, you know, you have to listen carefully. Um, and so we, we it, basically, if, if liturgical tradition is 2,000 years old, and actually even 3,000 years old, because the, the traditional Eastern and Western rites have a lot of Jewish elements in them as well, which were purged from the Novus Ordo, except when they were artificially reintroduced in other ways, um, like the Baraka blessing instead of the offertory. Uh, but basically, if, if you've got something that's been growing for 3,000 years, uh, it's going to take you more than one visit to enter into that and really absorb what it's giving you. And you know what? It's a lifelong apprenticeship. I've been going to the traditional mass for 30 years now. I mean, not exclusively, but certainly all during that time and exclusively over the past four years to the traditional Latin mass. And I'm still seeing and learning things all the time. It's so huge. It just keeps, and that's why I keep writing books and articles too. I never run out of things that there's never an end to things to talk about. Whereas Actually, with the Novus Ordo, to be completely frank, you know, and this is no slight about the sacrament that's present there, but it looks like a committee construct. I, I'm, I'm, it bores me. It bores a lot of people. It bores us to tears. It's like a, it's like a sort of sequential modular business agenda. You just do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and the prayers are hollow and 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 prosaic, and I mean, it's 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 awful from a phenomenological point of view. It's it's completely unsatisfactory and shallow. Um, it's shallow because it's rationalistic. Um, it's not the density of 3,000 years of mystery encrusted on itself millions of times. No, it's not that at all. Um, and so I think this is part of the reason why people kind of drift away from the Novus Ordo. Not everybody, but a lot of people, millions of people over the past 50 years have drifted away from it. It doesn't hold us. It doesn't have enough to hold us on a liturgical level, right? Yeah. And I mean, I would just challenge, I mean, what I've noticed is that some commentators who have strong opinions about this just are not experienced with the Latin mass. You know, they've seen a YouTube video that visited once or twice, but it's like commenting on Chinese culture without knowing the Chinese language. Mm -hmm. You can comment oh. from afar on an abstract sense, uh, but if you've never really prayed it and lived it, yes, uh, you are out of your element. Right. And it's also ironic uh, to say the least that many of the critics of trads are Eastern Catholics or they, or they prefer going to eat to, to Byzantine liturgy. Well, why is that? What, what are they finding there? You know, I mean, if that is, if they really want to defend the Novus Ordo and the absolute power of the Pope over liturgy and so on, then they should suck it up and go to the Novus Ordo all the time. And in fact, yeah. go to whatever Novus Ordo is available and not shop around for the most reverent one they can find. No, just take it as it is. Right. Anyway, but this is this yeah. Is I mean, and, and so I mean, just and just so everyone's aware, I I went to divine liturgy for four years plus every single Sunday. So I would say I I have a knowledge of the divine liturgy. Uh, I was Eastern Orthodox. I've been there, done that. The grace is not grass is not greener over there, um, and I've worshipped in the Latin Roman Rite, um, mm -hmm. and I've also attended the Novus Ordo for many years too. So mm -hmm. I I'm I'm speaking from my own experience. And I, I think that there's a knowledge gap or an experience gap, maybe, yes. uh, for, uh, you know, just respectfully, I, 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 I issue this respectful challenge, this trad challenge, go to the Latin mass for six months straight and, and see if you, if you notice the difference there, but we'll get into the Eastern Catholics. I wanted to get this, um, this chart here, which summarizes your points in chapter two. Um, so one of the most conspicuous things. I want to just talk about Ad Orientum because he also had the Apologia for of Paul VI, which is important. One of the most important conspicuous elements, obviously, is Ad Orientum. Uh, and the table altar and the versus populum stance in the Novus Ordo. 
Now, some people say, oh, well, that's not the way it was promulgated. That's not what Vatican II says. You can have a revert Novus Ordo. But as you show, this is actually not the promulgator of Vatican II, Paul VI. He himself promoted versus populum. And there's a reason why there's table altars in every single Roman Rite church nearly across the entire world. It's not because you know, there's just a spontaneous, uh, huge expense to put in every single church this table altar. No, this was the more or less official policy uh, de facto situation. It's not as simple as saying, oh, well, that's not what Vatican II says. Uh, but this is a, a rupture with the East and West tradition right here. Your comments on Ad Orientum. Yes. I mean, I, I actually, you know, there, we could do a whole show on, on, on Ad Orientum. But um, I mean, I think I think it's just it's as simple as this. You know, the evidence shows, as has been discussed very well by Father Uwe Michael Lang um, uh, in, in his book, Turning Towards the Lord, as well as Father Stefan Hyde in his important work. He's a professor of patristics uh, in, in Rome, um, that the, the evidence shows that the vast majority of liturgies in Christian history were celebrated ad orientum. There seem to be some exceptional cases, um, but it's it's you know, they are the exception that proves the rule. Uh, and and why? Why was this the case? Because from the very beginning, the Christians did not turn towards Jerusalem as the Jews did. They did not turn towards Mecca as later on the Muslims did. They turned towards the East because Christ himself in scripture is called the Orient, the East. Um, he was assimilated to the sole invictus, right? The unconquered, unconquerable sun, uh, God. That is to say, he was seen as the light that rises into the world and shines on all men, as it says in the prologue of, gospel, of the Gospel of John. There are many passages in Scripture that support this idea of Christ as the Orient. And he also says explicitly Christ in Matthew's Gospel. We just read it yesterday uh, for the last Sunday after Pentecost in the Roman Rite, um, that when the Son of Man returns, he will come from the east like the lightning that goes from the east to the west. And so the Christians, the early Christians faced east as an eschatological orientation, as a way of saying, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, right? As a way of preparing themselves um, personally and corporately for the coming, for the return of the Lord Jesus. And that's the fundamental meaning it has. It has other meanings that have been encrusted over it. Um, but, you know, this is a, another example where we don't get, I mean, scripture compared Christ to the Orient. We don't get to disagree with scripture on that. And and the, we should be antiquarians in the sense of following how the early Christians worshipped eastward, right? The irony here, and I'm just going to say this once because it could be said a hundred times. The irony is that the liturgical reformers always invoked antiquity. Oh, we want to do things the way that they were done in, in the early Christian period. No, nine out of time, nine out of 10 times, what they've returned to is not, not what the early Christians did, but what they, what the moderns either imagined that the early Christians did or just made up and attributed to them, right? What did the early Christians actually do in addition to standing eastwards, facing eastwards to worship? They also fasted and abstained a huge amount, right? Where does that survive? Well, it survives in the Byzantine world with their fasting and abstinence rules. And it survived in the traditional Roman rite, all the way down to Paul VI. Now, granted, it needed an overhaul in the sense that a lot of people were getting dispensations and not taking it seriously. But what did the reformers do? Instead of going back to the ancient custom of fasting and abstinence, they just abolished it, right? And this is what you see again and again with ember days, rogation days, you know, the octave of Pentecost, the season after Pentecost, all sorts of things that were ancient customs, one year annual cycle of lectionary. All these sorts of examples are the ancient, the truly ancient Eastern and Western common customs that were thrown overboard, thrown out by the liturgical reformers. Yeah, you you succinctly uh, summarize the method, the methodology here on page 288. You say, quote, the, in reality, the liturgical reformers frequent appeal to Byzantine, and we might add, also add just ancient, Byzantine this and Byzantine that should not blind us to their willful selectivity, end quote. This is this is what they're doing is they're they're and this is what they do in doctrine, too. We saw this with the Walter Casper proposal, which was trying to impose an Eastern Orthodox custom on us, which is actually corruption. Um, mm -hmm. They they look for some example of something that's even apparent or or tangentially related to their own uh, uh, ideological program they've already decided on. Yes. They go into history and they try to find some example somewhere that might be somewhere 
somehow related to that. Yes. They say, oh, well, look, and this, as you just said from that Garangi quote earlier, this is exactly what all heretics do. They, I mean, yeah. and I'm not saying every single person who did this was a heretic, but this is the same historical mindset of trying to cherry pick things from the, from the, uh, the history, which is dubious right. in some cases, scholastically dubious. We don't even know exactly what yeah. happened here or there. Right. Um, and that's, what, that's why I have, I mean, I have in this book, I have a whole chapter on the phrase mysterium fidei, which was, which is found in the, in the formula of the consecration of the wine in the Roman rite has always been there. It's there in the earliest manuscripts we have. It's never not been there for the whole history of the Roman rite. Um, why is it there? It's mysterious. I mean, I go into, into the different explanations that have been given. Even Josef Jungmann, sort of like the, you know, the, 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 uh, the hero of the liturgical reformers, even Josef Jungmann says, you know, this is a very mysterious thing. You know, we shouldn't touch it, whatever. And then, and what do the liturgical reformers do? They rip it out of the place, the only place it's ever been. And then they turn it into uh, an occasion for a popular acclamation, which has never existed before. They're just making stuff up right? Um, because of their own ideas about active participation, whatever. Let me give you an example of this Byzantine craze, the craze for artificial Easternization of the Roman rite, okay? Because that's part of the problem that we're talking about here is the times when the liturgical reformer said, hey, we like that idea over in the East. Let's jam it into the Roman rite where it's never existed before, right? The epiclesis, right? The epiclesis is... The moment in the in the Eastern liturgies, they, it exists in all of them in one form or another, where the priest calls upon the Holy Spirit to come down and transform the gifts of bread and wine into the body and blood of, of Christ, right? And it's a somewhat controversial subject in some discussions because, you know, in these Eastern rites, they have the the, narr the formula of consecration. This is my body. This is my uh, the cup, the chalice of my blood. And then after that, there's the epiclesis, which seems to be, for some of them, they say this is what consecrates the gifts. So that's that's been an interesting debate. I've written about that elsewhere. We don't need to get into that right now. But the Roman rite never had an epiclesis. Okay, I disagree with, with, with Martin Mosebach on this point. It never had an epiclesis. It didn't need one. Why? Because the Roman canon is older, is an older anaphora, an older Eucharistic prayer than any of the Eastern ones. So don't ever let anybody tell you that, oh, the Eastern rites are the most ancient ones. No, no, they're not. The Roman canon is older than the, than the, the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom or St. Basil the Great. And those anaphoras were influenced by the so-called Macedonian heresy or the the what did they call the, the Panumatomachian heresy? Panumatomachi. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, the, in the East, that is those who denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit, because just like there were Arians denying the divinity of Christ, there were also heretics denying the divinity of the Holy Spirit, which is why St. Basil wrote his great treatise on the Holy Spirit, in which he says, by the way, that ad orientem is an apostolic practice. Um, but uh, the East had this controversy about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And so when they were finalizing their anaphoras, because their, their liturgy also organically developed, they inserted into it an epiclesis, invoking the divine spirit to transform these gifts. Well, there was never a heresy that denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit in the Roman church. And therefore, there was no uh, need for an epiclesis in the Roman canon. In fact, the theology of consecration is different. For us, in the West, the priest invokes the Almighty Father, and the Almighty Father, the Pater Familias of the whole cosmos, uh, the Almighty Father is so pleased with his own son, in whose name the priest asks him to transform the gifts, that he does it by his omnipotence, right? And, and this is a very Roman way of thinking. The father in the family has all the power in the family. So what he says goes, okay? So to forcibly insert an epiclesis into the Roman canon would be to denature it, to completely misunderstand the theology behind the transubstantiation there, okay? Not that the Holy Spirit isn't involved, but he's not explicitly mentioned, right? Um, so that's an example of where in all of the newly created Eucharistic prayers, which is also a huge aberration, there's never been a Eucharistic prayer other than the Roman canon in the West, they inserted all of these Greek style epicleses, right? Um, so, you know, that's that's an example of, of the kind of phenomenon we're talking about. Yes, and some, some critics of the trad movement uh, have found what they think are deficiencies in the Roman rite, such as what you just said, uh, or they, they quote, for example, the lack of pedo communion, uh, mm -hmm. because infants perhaps would have uh, been communed earlier in, in the history of the Roman rite. Mm -hmm. And so then they go to become Eastern Catholic, and then they critique the trads, but this is a hypocrisy because 
if, if you say that you can you can leave the Novus Ordo, you can leave the Roman Rite altogether and go east because of some deficiency in the Roman Rite, why cannot a trad leave the Novus Ordo and go to the, to the Latin Mass because of a perceived deficiency? Yeah. <laughs> but even though the fact that they're, you know, this this whole argument is is misunderstanding because it's den- again it's den- it's making making some form of the claim that there's been a corruption basically. Yes. Because and, and oh, yeah, I think we have to recognize that that I mean this is something John Paul II I think was very good on, but not just him, that there are um, there are differences between the way the Eastern and Western traditions developed that are not that don't necessarily mean one is right and the other is wrong. Yes, there's a, there's a certain diversity of theological expression and of liturgical life that's possible while still remaining totally orthodox in the in the full sense, orthodox, small o, as in right worship, right doctrine. And so um, one example of this, I'll just throw it out there is, you know, kneeling to receive communion on the tongue. OK, yeah. well, even if it was the case in some parts of the early church, in some places in the early church that people received communion in the hand. They received it in a different way than how it was reintroduced by Northern European heretics in the 1960s. Um, And even then, it doesn't matter because the very reverence towards the Blessed Sacrament in the early church that was there in the early church led to the development of communion on the tongue and kneeling. And and so so if if somebody somebody from the East, you know, they they look at the the council, uh, the Quinisext council and some of the the, the provisions there that say that people should receive in the hand and shouldn't be given communion in the mouth, right? Well, even the East changed its mind about that for the sake of deeper reverence, right? And in the West, we added to that kneeling at the same time, which in the East is a penitential practice. Well, in the West, it doesn't always have the same significance as kneeling has in the East. So that sometimes you get these really hardcore ortho bros who are like, you know, it's against the Council of Nicaea for you to be kneeling on a Sunday, heretics, right? What if kneeling means something else for us after a certain point than it does for you? Okay, let's try to have a serious understanding of differences that develop over centuries, right? So pedo communion is another example of this, that it's, yes, I mean, I think it would lead to, her- if you really thought that the words of Jesus about the Eucharist, that if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have life in you, mean that anyone who doesn't re- actually receive the Eucharist cannot be saved. You'd be a heretic for holding that, right? Because the, the church has always held that someone who's just been baptized and has never received communion is saved. Why is that? Because baptism orders them to the reception of the, of, of the Eucharist. That's the completion of the Christian life. That's the summit, the high point of it. And so in the East, they complete they still complete all the initiation at once, baptism, chrismation, and Holy Communion. Fine. But it has to be admitted that in the early church, the ones who were mostly being baptized were adults, right? So they went through baptism, chrismation, and communion, and they were able, you might say, subjectively to perceive the reality of the real presence of Christ and or to, to, to acknowledge it voluntarily and intellectually. And therefore, it could become the crowning moment for them. Um, I think an argument could be made that that a little child, right, you baptize the child so he's a member of Christ's body, but you could legitimately wait until the child's older and can actually make an act of faith in the real presence of Christ in under the species of bread and wine in order to give him communion then, right? So it, when you think about these things with even a little more nuance and subtlety, you can start to see, oh, yes, there are arguments in favor of both the Eastern position and the Western position. Both leavened bread and unleavened bread have arguments for them, right? Why do we need to, to, why do we need to attack each other over things that are both legitimate, right? Yeah, I, I think that the, we need to look to the instead of this this impious attack there's actually the way that the saints have done this is that they they consider each other as in competition for holiness and humility and so that's why saint bonaventure ripped up his eucharistic hymn in in front of saint thomas so we're actually looking at the east and if they do anything better than us we want to do that if you fast more than us we want to fast like you or if, if you look at us and you know we have this thing that you want to do that then we're all competing for holiness, but it's yeah. it's ultimately this arbitrary imposition of your private opinion where you think there was some corruption. I mean, what one could go to the Oriental Orthodox right. Well, they have communion in in two different species. They have a spoon for the precious blood, and they have a spoon for the for the body. They're they're two separate communion lines. Yes. Yes. Well, what if that's the early practice? Well, why yeah. don't we reject the divine liturgy and we go to the right. two different? I mean, 
this is just an arbitrary imposition. Yes. Instead, instead, we need to receive the tradition. We need right. to reverently receive the tradition as it's been handed down in all these different local customs and more universal customs in regards to the Roman rite. There are these different traditions which are all they're in, in one sense, they're all equal, but in another sense, they're also in this sort of competition because we want to always more may have more perfect worship yes. to Almighty God. Yes, exactly. Now let's go back to our chart. And I would I would suggest, Timothy, that if you wouldn't mind, maybe we maybe we could just talk. I could just talk quickly through this chart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Because otherwise we'll be here for hours and hours and hours. Yes. So we talked about Ad Orientum. We mentioned that. Um Remember, what we're looking at here is the column on the left is what all traditional liturgies have, Eastern and Western. The column on the right is the Novus Ordo. So all the traditional liturgies have an ancient and fixed anaphora with specified usage. So that anaphora is just the fancy term for Eucharistic prayer. Um, in the East, you know, you've got the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom. You've got one of St. Basil. You've got one of St. James. It's not used very often. Um, uh, in, and you've got the uh, liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. That's not really an anaphora, but it's a similar kind of thing. Um, in the West, what you had was the Roman canon. Uh, and and that's that's the predominant anaphora that was there. Um, and so in, in any of these cases, you each day, the priest doesn't decide from a sort of menu of Eucharistic prayers, which one he's going to use, but you know exactly what you're going to use and you must use that one. That's the traditional approach. That's not the Novus Ordo approach. Um, the traditional approach is to have an elaborate offertory, right? By which the sacrificial finality of gifts is signified. In other words, the offertory itself already anticipates the offering of the victim. That you see this in the offering of the prosper and the Byzantine right. It is actually rather extravagant. You know, in that in that ritual, there's actually a stabbing of the gifts. You know, with a lance and and and, and mentioning it as you know the as the the lamb and and wounding it. I mean, this is yes. this is a very elaborate offertory. There's something similar in the in the Roman rite. Uh, with its offertory that was removed from the Novus Ordo and replaced with a quasi-Jewish baraka or blessing ceremony that's never existed in any Christian liturgy before. It's completely absurd. Um, all right. In traditional liturgies, uh, the Eucharist is treated with utmost veneration. Only the clergy handle it. It's placed directly into the mouth. The particles are carefully gathered and consumed. There are lavish signs of latreia, of worship of God, right? In the Novus Ordo, Ex the explicit rubrics do not adequately safeguard the Blessed Sacrament. There's an intentional removal of most of the reverential practices and signs. Um, and uh, there's a severance of, of the connection between the sacrifice and communion. I go into details about that in the book. Did you want to show the Bauer chart? Oh, yeah. I was just going to pull that up really quickly. Uh, this is something that our mutual friend Jacob Bauer put together. So shout out to Jacob. Thanks for putting this together. Um, so this shows all the many different i mean I, I, the usccb wants to make a eucharistic revival and we're all for eucharistic revival that's great thank god for that uh and we have founded <laughs> our, our our bishop schneider has founded the crusade of eucharistic reparation so go to one peter 5.com slash crusade to join but this is the elephant in the room that if we don't deal with this we're we're we might be spinning our wheels so um, tell us about this chart that uh, Bauer put together. Question. Right. Well, so it showed, as it's, as the title says, it's showing practices of Eucharistic devotion. I would say reverence, perhaps is a better word there, in the Mass, and it lists a whole bunch of practices. Um, and it, I mean, I think it would take us too long to go into the whole list, um, but you can see it for yourself. All of these practices are required in the traditional Roman rite. I call it just the Roman rite because that's the only Roman rite there is realistically speaking, um, objectively speaking, um, you know, and, and it's, it's when you, when you get to be used, when you go grow accustomed to the traditional Roman, right. You, you recognize the subtlety with which all of these, um, all of these things that Bauer is pointing out are present. For example, the priest, he, he never turns his back on the tabernacle. Whenever he crosses in front of the blessed sacrament, he always genuflects. I mean, there, there, there are so many little signs of love and adoration that and it teaches you it teaches you wordlessly in a very deep way that something special is present there in the tabernacle now if, if you if you go back to that bauer chart for a second uh sure. then th you can see that on the other hand all of these things are either optional in the novus ordo or they're suppressed suppressed is maybe a strong word maybe you say abolished that is they don't exist 
they, they're, they're not part of the, the ceremony, of the ritual anymore. Um, and, the, and the Vatican has clarified on a number of occasions, if something is not there, it's not supposed to be done. Um, and similarly, these optional things, very, very sadly, uh, tragically, scandalously, I would say, the, they are usually optioned out of existence, as a priest friend of mine put it. That is, if something more reverent is an option, it's almost never done. Now, I, I know there are young, good, young, faithful clergy out there who are trying to do all of these things, but you know better than anyone what an uphill battle, what a steep climb you face. Every single traditional option you choose is a battle for somebody at the chancery, maybe the bishop, maybe the pastor, or another priest, or the people, or the Susans and Karens, you know, whoever it is, uh, it's a battle. Every single option is a battle. And no wonder why people get tired of that and they just go with the path of least resistance, which is let the lay people do everything. It doesn't really matter. We can't control this. It's a disaster, right? All right, let's go back to our chart, the other chart. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me see. And I mean, this is just the the Eucharistic reverence is always there in, mm -hmm. in the Eastern and Western liturgies. Yes. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, got it. Go ahead. Right. Um, so then another point, all traditional liturgies have hierarchically structured clear roles in the liturgy for priest, deacon, subdeacon, lector, acolyte. Only men vested in the sanctuary do these things. And they do them with simultaneous action. In other words, lots of things are going on at the same time in the liturgy. In the Novus Ordo, the hierarchical offices are canceled out or confused. The distinction between clergy and laity is blurred. Roles of men and women are mingled in a way that would only be imaginable after the sexual revolution. And you have linear, modular, sequential liturgy. That is typically only one thing is happening at a time. Only one thing is allowed to happen at a time because of this rationalistic presupposition that everybody has to be following everything at every moment. Well, you, if you can only think of one thing at a time, as St. Thomas says, then of course you'd have to have a liturgy that's like an agenda. Of a, of a business meeting where one thing can, only one thing can happen at a time. But it, the traditional liturgy is like the universe itself. Millions of things are going on at the same time in the universe or billions or trillions of things are going on at the same time. And in the liturgy, you know, you have the priest saying one prayer and you have servers doing something else and you have the choir singing something else and the people might be saying their own prayers. It's this, it's not chaos. On the contrary, it's like, it's like a symphony where all different sorts of instruments are playing together and they're all playing different things in different timbres at different times, but it all comes together in one kind of symphony of, of praise, of worship. Um, we have, okay, all traditional liturgical rites make expressive theological use of church buildings and their parts, like the distinction between the sanctuary and the nave. Um, only certain people can go into the sanctuary. Sometimes there is even then a, a bigger barrier um, as in an iconostasis in an Eastern church, some Eastern rites use curtains to, so that nobody can see what's going on at the most solemn parts of the, of the liturgy, right? The Novus Ordo gets rid of that stuff. Um, let's see, you've got, yeah, here, here's, here's an example. This is, uh, yeah, this, this is a Coptic iconostasis. There's three doors and there's three curtains. Yes, exactly. Right. And so, by the way, when these um, these pseudo scholars who published at Church Life Journal, I say pseudo scholars in regard to liturgy matters, whatever else they might be actual scholars in, um, they, 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 they wrote, uh, Cavadini, Healy and Winandy wrote an article in Church Life Journal that said about the traditional Roman rite that it it cuts the people off from the offering of the sacrifice um, and it gave various reasons for doing that. Well, everything they said would also have been true of the traditional Eastern liturgies. So they insulted all of the Eastern liturgies in what they wrote as well. And, and they said it was, they, they also said it wasn't even an abuse of the Latin mass. It was intrinsically yes. within the Roman rite itself. It exactly. cut the people off from oh, yeah. the bad and, ecclesiology. And they actually ended up saying that the Tridentine rite, which they falsely said is only 400 years old, in, in reality, even if you take the strictest definitions, uh, it's a thousand years old and much of it much older than that. Uh, but they were actually saying that there were intrinsic theological deficiencies in the Tridentine Rite. Now, I mean, I find that astonishing that anybody would say that about the way that the Catholic Church has worshipped for over a thousand years and the way that the Eastern Church has worshipped for all their history as well, right? And they, and they don't see... Uh, you know, the elephant in the room, which is the theological deficiencies in the Novus Ordo. I mean, it's, it's astonishing that, that there could be such blindness, but, you know, this is what we're doing. Yes. All right, let's go back to the chart. Um, 
in all traditional rites, you find uh, the chanting of fixed liturgical texts according to age-old melodies, right? Whether these are Byzantine modes or Gregorian chant modes and, and melodies. Um, and these texts, the liturgical texts, the orations, the antiphons, the readings, uh, the, uh, the anaphoras and so on, they, they cover the whole of Christian doctrine with honesty, excluding nothing difficult or uncomfortable. That's what you find in Eastern and Western rites. In the Novus Ordo, the normative mode is text spoken aloud in a declamatory manner for didactic aims. It's a very verbose. Chant is rarely used. It's an option, but it's rarely used. Texts lack stability and fixity. There are lots of options. There's a certain amount of extemporaneity that's allowed. The texts tend to be dumbed down. That's been demonstrated. I'm sorry if you're insulted by that, but it's just been demonstrated. I, I, I've written about it in my books. Lauren Christus has written about this. Um, and it ex and this, most of all, it excludes difficult or uncomfortable truths. We see this in the careful editing out of difficult or uncomfortable truths from the lectionary. As In spite of it being so much bigger, it actually contains less of the full message of divine revelation than the traditional one-year lectionary does. I think you could make that argument very, very convincingly. Um, you know, the Roman canon talks about predestination. Every single day, the Roman canon mentions predestination. Where is that in the Novus Ordo? You know what I mean? So this is, you know, you there's so much missing there. And that's the thing. Thomas Pink points this out about official theology. People notice what's present, but they don't notice what's absent, right? For obvious reasons, right? What's missing? Well, I don't know what's missing. Well, the only way you could know what's missing is if you knew what the tradition had already, right? And this is where your six month, you know, trad challenge comes into, into play. I, I mean, I like to joke with people that I became a, a, a traditionalist by reading my daily missile. And I just brought my daily missile to mass and I read, and I was like, what the heck? This, I never saw any of this before. Yeah, talking right? about sin and hell and mortification. Wow. I mean, you know, you, you get to December 6th, right? I'm going to mass for the Feast of St. Oh, Nicholas yes. in the Roman Rite. And, you know, and you're thinking like St. Nicholas, jolly St. Nicholas with his golden balls and he's giving presents to the children. And, oh, isn't that sweet? And, of course, I love St. Nicholas. He's And I love everything about Christmas and Advent. But the collect of it says, you know, basically... Oh God, you know, by the prayers, uh, by the intercession of St. Nicholas, deliver us from the fires of hell. Okay. This is the, this is the, your collect. Well, that's the kind of thing that it just, you get, you get blasted by the traditional right with all different aspects of the Catholic faith. And I don't want to give the impression that it's doom and gloom. No, it's, it's also about the glory of God and the majesty of the angels and, you know, the miracles of the saints and the apparitions of Our Lady, it's all these wonderful positive things. And the doom and gloom is also there. And when you, and if you think about that as like a huge sphere of Catholic, of Catholic reality and Catholic truth, in the Novus Order, that sphere is much, much confined, right? Um, and again, if people think I might be exaggerating this, just, just read about it. Okay. I have an article, for instance, at 1 Peter 5 called Christian Militancy in the Prayer of the Church. If you read that article, you'll see exactly one illustration among countless illustrations of what I'm talking about. The theme of militancy, of the church militant, of the Catholic faithful being soldiers who have to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil, who have to fight bearing the standard of Christ the King, who have to bring the kingdom of Christ into the world. All of that language has been is there in the old right and has been stripped out of the new right, right? Um, in keeping, I guess, with Nostra Aetate and Dignitatis Humanae and who knows what else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I just want to emphasize, this is why the Latin Novus Ordo is insufficient. You can have a perfectly perfect in every way Latin Novus Ordo, but the Latin text itself still censors yes. the word hell. Yes, yes. So basically, basically, here's the thing, okay? Uh, there are two levels of liturgy. There's the the external phenomenological level, the aesthetic level, and, and, and we can use the expression smells and bells to cover that level. And then there's the actual textual, rubrical, and ceremonial content of the liturgy. Right? What's being prayed, how it's being prayed, you know, uh, and those two levels should not be separated from each other. They're like a body-soul composite. Um, and so if somebody just wants the smells and bells, I mean, I love them too. I want the incense and the chant and the beautiful vestments and everything. But if they, if they say that's enough, that's a skin deep, that's a superficial approach to things. Okay. Because that skin belongs to a body. 
And what is the body? Okay. Is the body, you know, uh, muscular and fully developed or is it a dwarfish and, you know, atrophied body, right? What, what is the body of that skin? Right. That's why the aesthetic dimension, it's important. It's extremely important, but it's not sufficient. Yes, absolutely. So there's two more quick points sure, I wanted, sure. to, wanted to touch on, and I want to get a few questions. We're uh, getting close to the end of our time here. One is uh, the vernacular. This is something you mentioned in your book. Another superficial similarity here, because yes. as you point out, there are it, it depends on which Eastern right you're going to, honestly, because oh, yes. some Eastern churches do have a lot of uh, understandable. What I'll say is understandable language, because I want to I want to contrast. Uh, you know, just vulgar, la vulgar language that you understand versus <laughs> high language, like yeah. Elizabethan English. We all understand that's a more sacred form of English. But even in the, the largest, it, and we have to go to the Orthodox world here, but the largest Eastern church is Russia. And they use church, church Slavonic. The, yes. the common person doesn't even understand that. But it's it's not something, you know, what what would happen if, if we came along, again, applying the same principles to the East and saying, well, you have to translate all your ancient church lephonic into modern russian you know not only modern L russian but just vulgar russian the most mm -hmm. vulgar you know so this 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 the superficiality that you might yes. you know you might find this for example in diaspora churches in the americas in western europe yes. you might have a lot more active participation among those churches that are eastern right because of the context but if you went if you go to the old world you're probably not going to have as much of that active participation. In fact, I can tell you a story that in my Arab Orthodox church that I used to go to, they came out of the seminary because people were singing and actively participating. But the people who were coming from the seminary saying, we have to restore the old customs and have just the chanter chant this. No more congregational singing. You know, So there is a strong tradition for uh, a, a similar situation uh, in the East. Um, and there's a lot to say on that. But I wanted yeah. to finally get the the... One of the biggest points, I think, is what I've talked with a few people who are critics of the trad movement. Again, um, uh, thinking of another individual who Eastern right going back and forth here. And there seems to be this 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 faith in the Roman church where it has to be all or nothing. You have to either have the pope is sort of always correct in every single thing and he can only be an error in the smallest possible way. Uh, or he's, or I need to become Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And I, and there seems to be a lack of faith in the Roman dogmas really, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, we can't, yeah. we can't be in this space where we can say, oh, well, this Pope did some, you know, we ultimately found out that that was a, that was a problem. So we reversed that, you know, that's happening throughout history. There's all sorts of different bad Pope, yes. bad papal yeah. decisions, yes. various things, whether that's liturgical or not, or political or excommunicating right. this person or that person wrongly or whatever. That happens in history. And if you don't, if you don't have a stronger faith in the Roman dogmas, a stronger faith in Vatican I, honestly, which is sort of ironic, you're not going to be able to uh, deal with all these ambiguities. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be able to be in a place where our faith is strong enough, where we can we can really get into the truth of this matter. Yes. Uh, and, because I think that there's there's a weakened faith somewhere sometimes where it, it causes people to lash out at others because they assume that if if the Pope can be wrong on this, then we should just leave the church and go become an Eastern Orthodox. And no, that's yeah. not the case. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's, it, I mean, there's so many errors in, in that, that mentality that you just described. Um, I mean, the, the first, the most basic thing is, I mean, Eric, Eric Ibarra's work. I, I definitely, um, I mean, I, he and I have disagreements, but I, I respect him for being very honest about certain difficulties Yes. That you run into in history. I mean, he said he put it basically like this. He said, like the evidence for papal primacy, like the Catholic Church wins, but by a sliver. Like, yeah, he, I agree he with that. Very right. seriously, the Eastern Orthodox objections to the way in which papal primacy and authority has been configured and exercised and described by the Roman Church. Um and, and I think we also have to recognize, you know, of course, the state of contests out there are going to bristle if there's even any who would bother to watch this. But, you know, we have to look at, I mean, John Paul II and Benedict XVI both also said, it's not a sin to ask whether the way in which the papacy has been exercised uh, could be modified or could be rethought in order to bring about a reunion with the Eastern Orthodox. I mean, as Ratzinger famously said, you know, Maybe what's necessary, in a sense, is for the East to and the West to agree about the exercise of the papacy as it was 
uh, done in the first millennium and not some of its extrapolations in the second millennium. I mean, I'm not, this is a, these are huge topics and I'm not trying to open them up right now, but just, just to say, you know, uh, even if you understand Vatican one, as you pointed out, Vatican one's definition, it, it's not just a glorification of the Pope. It's a, a sharp hedging about of the Pope with conditions uh, yeah. under, under which the infallibility of the church is exercised by him. Um, and by the way, I mean, I can't, I can't refrain from recommending at this point to all readers, John Joy. John Joy's work is so important yes. on this matter. Um, I have a, there's a book by him. I don't know if I have a copy of it handy, um, but. Yeah, I'll put it up on the screen. But, My kids uh, are playing drums in the background. Just, uh, I'll put it up uh, on the screen. There's there's a book that I just recently published with Os Justi Press by Dr. John Joy, who's an expert on the history and theology of the magisterium, called Disputed Questions on Papal Infallibility. And much of the material, thank you, that's it, uh, you have seen, you know, much of it has already appeared online in one place or another. This is all collected together in one convenient uh, and very readable book. Um, he John Joy does an excellent job of, of both pointing out the many, many times in church history, he gives many examples of infallible decisions by popes so that we're not just stuck with always saying, oh, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. No, I mean, he, he shows dozens of examples of it. But on the other hand, he's very good at also in, 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 in league with Vatican I and, and all of its good interpreters like Gosser saying, no, 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 but here, here are the actual limits on papal infallibility so that Outside of those limits, papal error is actually possible, right? I think it's ironic that Catholics would be tempted by the Eastern Orthodox to embrace um, a sort of idealized version of tradition when what they should really do is just embrace their own concrete Roman tradition and say, look, I'm not, I, I don't understand, you know, I don't have God's perspective. I don't understand what's going on with these recent popes and why they have been so blinded to the harm that the liturgical rupture has caused. But I can say this much, tradition in the West is valuable, it's good, it's holy, it's, it's of God, and, and, and the tradition in the West has to be embraced and preserved and passed on. That much I can be absolutely certain about, whatever the popes are doing. OK. Um, and so in other words, to have confidence, as you say, not only in God's providence, that he's going to take us out of this crisis, that he's going to lead the church forth from this crisis, but also confidence in our own tradition and not to be like the Protestants and the modernists who are essentially attacking and rejecting our tradition along with the liturgical reformers. If, if we do that, what, what's going to prevent us from becoming skeptics about the Eastern Orthodox tradition? After all, their tradition has also organically developed. You know, exactly. They, they they pretend. I'm sorry. Some of them pretend. Maybe they know better. I hope I hope they know better. But they talk as if they have this sort of eternal liturgy that descended from heaven, fully, you know, fully <laughs> right. formed, like you know, like Athena from the head of Zeus, which just sort of popped out there. And there you have the full the divine liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom. All you have to do is read scholarship on it to know that it developed just like the Roman liturgy developed over the centuries. Saint John Chrysostom. Sorry to pop any balloons there. He didn't write. The whole liturgy that has his name he probably contributed something to it same with saint basil right uh but they, they they were not the authors of it in the sense of like they penned every single line and all the things that are i mean you can't say this it's a it's a corporate um collective work of christian art right all the traditional liturgical rites are that uh that, that and they develop over many centuries Yes. So let's I, again, this noting this this important essay, just go read it. If you're questioning Eastern Orthodoxy, go read this. Is, because what you just pointed out was so perfect because the, the hyper uber ultramontanists idealize the papacy. The Eastern, Eastern Orthodox take that times a thousand about synodality and conciliarity. That's a it's just a, a complete, complete historical myth when you get into the, the, the mess of history. It's way more messy than what they and what's the, the saddest thing is that you know, for all their conciliarity, they haven't had a council since 787. So uh, talk yeah. about living in a fantasy world again. And and we'll have uh, e Ibarra. Eric Ibarra has a great book on the papacy that just came out. St. Paul Center. We'll have him on uh, this show to talk about the first millennium. Very important. I, I wanted to get at least one question here from the audience here, Dr. Kwasniewski. <laughs> and this is, can you elaborate on this? You, you made a comment. Can we say the Novus Northern Trivis Roman Rite 
are separate rights. This is the argument, the main yeah. of the main arguments in your book. Can you elaborate on the Roman right versus the Montini right? Go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I mean, actually that chart we were looking at earlier, um, I don't even know if we got to the bottom of it. I think you got very near the bottom of it. Maybe we should just pull it up. Let me see. Time. I've no, got, uh, let's see, the, this one here? This one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, 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 okay. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I was talking about the chant. Um, right, exactly. So, I mean, I, I go, I go, I attack this question uh, that was just asked um, in several chapters of the book because you can attack it from different angles. Um, one of the angles, the main angle that we've been concentrating on is how the Novus Ordo differs from any traditional Eastern or Western liturgy. And once you've proved that, you've proved that it must be a separate rite. I mean, however you're going to explain that, I, you know, I call it the modern rite, the Ritus Modernus uh, with Klaus Gamber, or the rite of Paul VI. Um, you know, that raises questions about do popes are, are popes actually authorized to draw up rights from scratch um but that's another just another time we can talk about that um but it's the, the it would be a ritus modernus something else but you can also attack the question just by looking closely at the roman rite and the novus ordo in comparison um what makes the roman rite the roman rite people could come up with different lists um my list here are nine things that we could look at that are very obvious the roman canon as required and exclusive, the use of Latin, uh, Gregorian chant, the lectionary, the one-year lectionary that, that developed in the first millennium, uh, the calendar, the offertory uh, that, that I talked about before, the proleptic sacrificial offertory, the ad orientem stance, parallelism of liturgical action, and the separate communion of the priest. That is, the priest receives communion and completes the sacrifice before the people are even addressed to receive communion. Um, those things are all baked into, they're, they're just bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of the Roman rite. Um, the Novus Ordo deviates from all of those things. The Roman canon is optional, little used, use of Latin, optional, discouraged, Gregorian chant, optional, discouraged, lectionary replaced with a totally different lectionary, the calendar, there's a severely reduced calendar that's missing all kinds of ancient Roman elements. Um, the offertory was removed and replaced with the Jewish baraka. Uh, the autorantum stance optional, discouraged. Parallelism of spiritual action nearly absent. The separate communion of the priest was expressly canceled. Um, and so, when one of the points that emerges from this and and from my and from the earlier discussion is the very fact that so many things are optional are left at the option of the priest is itself perhaps the meta deviation of the Novus Ordo. That is to say, it's the quality that most of all separates it from any traditional Christian liturgy, right? Uh, and why do I say that? Because when a Byzantine priest or really a Coptic priest or, or, or you know, Armenian priest, whoever it is, whatever Eastern rite you're talking about, when he approaches the altar of God on any given day of the liturgical year, he knows exactly what he's supposed to do. All of the prayers are set forth for him. All of the ceremonies, it's just Boom, he's like a train on the tracks, just going along. And everybody else knows if they're familiar with that, right? They know what he's doing. They sing along with him, right? Same thing in the Trinity Mass. Boom. If it once that mass starts, low mass, high mass, solemn mass, pontifical mass, it doesn't matter what it is. It's like a train on the tracks. All of it is determined from, from beginning to end, right? With the Novus Ordo, every step of the way, there's a choice that has to be made. It's, that's why some people call it the vel missile. Vel is the word for or in Latin. So it's this, vel, that, this or that, right? It's the this or that missile. And, and that on many levels, even down to the whole ethos of the experience, whether it's a life team, you know, so, so whether it's going to be a smells and bells uh, oratorian style Novus Ordo or a life team jamboree with rock music, right? Even that's an option, right? Um, and 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 you it'd be hard you'd be hard pressed nowadays to argue that that the the life team mass is abusive right uh, according to whom what rubric is it violating right so I I think here we're we're really dealing with um so as I say the 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 meta deviation of the Novus Ordo that most separates it is its malleability variability unpredictability spontaneity etc all those qualities are from the point of view of liturgical history, they are negative. They are 
bad. Okay. Uh, and there's a reason why the church very rapidly moved away from all of those things in the early centuries to the extent that they existed. The Holy Spirit was driving the church towards fixity, determination, uh, constancy, um, you know, solidity, stability. These are the things that the church developed very early on in her worship. We, we have time for one more question. I want to just bring this up because this is kind of appropriate to, um, we're about to enter the liturgical season of Advent at the Roman Rite, and this is related to that somewhat. The, in Proxima says, are the Jasima Sundays, that is Septua Jasima, and the Meat Fair Cheese Fair analogous, that is that is the uh, Triodion, the pre-Lent season in the Byzantine Rite, are they analogous by coincidence? Is there a more direct connection between the oh. two? And this brings up an entire liturgical season that is pre-Lent, which was excised from the Novus Ordo, which is also in the Byzantine Rite. Yes. Comment on that. Exactly. All right. So, so just for the for the sake of viewers who don't necessarily know, the, um, the Septuagesima season is it's a kind of symbolic seventy days before Easter, but it's it's the, the three weeks prior to uh, Ash Wednesday. The three Sundays prior to that are a kind of pre-Lenten season where violet begins to be used, uh, where where the uh, the Alleluia, you know, uh, is is replaced with. Um, attract, you know, and so there's a kind of like, there's a sort of pre-Lenten period there. Uh, and my understand, and then the similar, similar thing exists exactly analogous in the Byzantine, right? Um, so once more a sign of their kinship, as well as of the antiquity of this pre-Lenten season. Why, why do they have the pre-Lenten season? I can't answer the very technical question of, was there a direct influence of East on West or West on East? I don't know. Um, my thought uh, on the basis of what I can recall reading, is that it was such an obvious thing psychologically that you needed to prepare for Lent some weeks in advance of Lent beginning. So you're not, as Lauren Christa says, you're not parachuted into Lent. Suddenly like, oh my gosh, it's Ash Wednesday. What am I going to be doing this Lent? You know. So I think there was such an obvious psychological benefit to that, that it developed um, independently in both traditions, that each of them has a pre-Lent for obvious reasons. Um, but I could I could be mistaken about that. There could Absolutely. be some more direct connection. Oh, yeah. So I, I just want to point, I, I mean, this Advent starts this Sunday. It's a perfect time. If if you have not looked at all these issues, it's a perfect time for you to pick up a Latin mass or you can, like a Matt Missile, or if you can't afford it, they're kind of expensive. You can go to divinum, divinumofficium.com and you can read these prayers for yourself. And in particular... Uh, I have an article where I, it was Advent that I had my own red pill moment with the Novus Ordo. I have an article called Advent Uncensored at 1 Peter 5. And I talk about some of these texts. Hey, we already mentioned St. Nicholas. That's coming up. Uh, but the collects and the post communions on the Sundays of Advent talk about, uh, you know, turning the way, array the wrath of God, despising earthly things. Um, we have more of the more of the paraliturgical commemoration of the four last things and ultimately fasting. Fasting during Advent, in, in the Roman Rite before that, there was the uh, Ember Days, which were days of fasting. And then even earlier, there were various customs of fasting, as well as in the Eastern Rite, there's fasting for Advent. So it's a perfect time to, if you really want to be trad, take on some penance for Advent. And uh, any co final comments for us, Dr. Kwasniewski? No, I just think, um, you know, there's there's just so much uh, to say about this topic. And it's uh, I mean, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but yes. um, but I, I will make one closing comment, which is that everything you can find extravagantly in the Eastern Rites, you can find subtly in the traditional Latin Rites. Um, and, and, and this is something that takes time. I, I too, like you, was spent several years in the Eastern uh, milieu, uh, becoming very familiar with, especially the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom that's used most often. Um, and at first, what impressed me was the differentness of it. You know, so much singing and so long and so many texts and, you know, just, and the stuff happening behind the iconostasis and whatever. So, and, and that's, I think, initially what hits you about a liturgical rite is how different it is from anything you've experienced before. But then as time went on and I got used to it, I started realizing, oh, wait a minute. That's like when the Roman rite does this other thing, you know, or and it, that is the Roman rite is very subtle. It speaks in a whisper, It, but it's 
everything is there extravagantly in the in the Eastern Rites and subtly in the Roman Rite. Let me just give one last example. The way that the liturgy exalts Our Lady, okay? Well, in the Eastern Rite, it exalts Our Lady, you know, to the skies. I mean, it says something like... Uh, Our holy, immaculate, you know, most blessed and glorious Lady of Theotokos, never Virgin Mary. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, it is truly right to bless you, O Theotokos, uh, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. And there are many texts like this throughout the, mm -hmm. the Eastern liturgies. Um, well, what do we find when we look at the TLM, right? What we find is that it exalts her by mentioning her anywhere from 10 to 12 times every day. Every day the liturgy is celebrated, she's invoked 10 or 12 times. The difference has to do with whether there are prayers after mass for low mass and things like that. But that's why I say 10 to 12. Um, and, and so, you know, I mean, uh, she's mentioned in the Confitior, in the Creed, the Sushi Be Sancta Trinitas, the Roman Canon, the Liberanos after the Lord's Prayer, the, you know, she's all over the place there, but quietly and subtly, right? Unlike in the, in the Eastern Rites. But what do we look at? What do we find when we look at the Novus Ordo? They sought to downplay Our Lady for ecumenical reasons, for, for Protestant ecumenical reasons. Um, her holy name, the terror of demons and the consolation of sinners is reduced to one to four mentions, and in practice at daily mass, one mention only, namely in the Eucharistic prayer, right? Um, this is, I mean, this is, that's the kind of thing that it took me a while to figure that out, you know, that, that to kind of see what was going on there. But once you realize it, then you say, it's one of those aha moments where you say, ah, yes, two brothers and a stranger. Yes, I think that the Marian devotion is, is the perfect way to conspicuously show this two brothers and a stranger absolutely um and on her feast day let's invoke our lady over all of the intentions here we hope that uh, this has been helpful to you as always you can go below to the show notes that will have the links to uh, dr kwashnevsky's book and a number of the articles we've mentioned uh so this is a great book to buy for a priest buy one for yourself buy another one for a priest give it to a priest because Unfortunately, uh, there are many, as you said, there are many good priests out there who are struggling to make the Novus Ordo more reverent because they're good priests. They're good men of God who are care about these situations, but they may they may just be totally unaware of, of the depth of the issues. And this book, which is the manifesto of years and years and years of scholarship and pondering and prayer, praying the Novus or praying the Roman Rite, uh, Dr. Kwasniewski has given us so dr k thanks so much for writing this important text uh so buy it below merry christmas to your priest let's pray oh go ahead <laughs> do you have a something else just laughing okay let's pray an ave and we'll also invoke our patrons at one peter five let's pray In the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl, pray for us. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King.